Okay, and I've got some uh, leftovers from class, some uh, reminders, um, some hints, and um, I don't think I had any corrections this time, but I have some vocab that maybe wasn't well highlighted along the way. You know, jumping through the content like this, um, sometimes uh, I forget a few words. Um, first of all, something that I didn't really get to clarify is that carbon really is the bottom line of energy. Um, a lot of the alternatives aren't competitive because we don't really have an economic consideration um, of carbon. But um, if we attach dollars to carbon, all of a sudden alternatives become really competitive because they don't have as much carbon pollution. So, um, you know, gasoline is really cheap because you're not thinking about how expensive the climate change is. Coal burning power plants make relatively cheap electricity, or at least they, they made uh, na natural gas makes cheap electricity. But that's because nobody's including the price of climate change. Now, if we added a tax for carbon, fossil fuels would nosedive right away. They would stop being competitive because fossil fuels make a lot of carbon. If we tax that carbon, all of a sudden fossil fuels would um, lose their competitive edge. So basically we've taken the cost of climate change and we've moved it outside the consideration. We're doing something, burning fossil fuels, without factoring in the cost of climate change. What's interesting is you can calculate the cost of climate change. Uh, we have really good estimates for how much it will cost to fight sea level rise, uh, how much it will cost to spend more money on seafood because you can't farm oysters. Um, there's nerds that calculate this all the time. And then you could take all of the costs of fighting climate change. You know, the government spends more money on hurricane relief. Um, we have to move coastal infrastructure uphill because sea level is clearly rising. Um, we could take all of those costs for climate change and then we could assign a little bit of those costs into relevant transactions. So when you buy gasoline, you pay an extra 10 cent tax because that's how much the gasoline will add to the pool of expenses from climate change. Um, you know, fossil fuel electricity should be more expensive if we wanted to include the cost of climate change. And um, this isn't private costs, this is government cost. So we'll all pay for that. Every time you see a car with big old tires driving down the asphalt, you should think, dang it, I got to spend more of my tax dollars patching that guy's potholes. Or every time um, you see somebody who leaves their uh, landscape lights on all night, you should think, oh, that electricity comes from fossil fuels. I'm going to have to pay a little bit more climate change consequence because of that guy. Um, you know, through our tax dollars. And so the idea of a carbon tax is to internalize climate change costs into uh, transactions where climate change was previously externalized. Um, another way to do this, this is more vocab, um, is called tradable permits or tradable allowances. Uh, some people call these uh, pollution credits. There's a lot of words for this, but the concept is you set a permitted or allowed level of pollution. Your power plant can make one ton of CO2 and your power plant can make one ton of CO2. Everybody gets an allowance, a permit, an amount that they're allowed to pollute. And then you can imagine that if somebody doesn't make the pollution, now they didn't use their permit. 
if somebody makes more pollution, they got to buy a permit from somebody else or they get fined. So the idea here is you allow free market competition because whoever doesn't make pollution makes a ton of money selling their permits. And whoever is a polluter has to pay extra to stay in business. Then the government can buy up these permits, right? And take them off the market to lower the total pollution output. Uh, this is pretty common. It's actually done a lot, not necessarily for CO2, but for other types of pollution. Um, the idea of adding costs to CO2 has become political recently, but this was totally standard um, to manage uh, the ingredients that make smog. Okay, um, this was in the reader. This was just not in our class yet. Um, a couple of words you should know. Thermal pollution was in a previous unit, but it's kind of relevant here because uh, hot water comes out of power plants. Remember the cooling cycle, so uh, the condenser loops. So you bring in cold water from the environment to cool down the steam, to condense the steam back into water that goes to the steam generation. And now you've heated that water and that goes out to the environment. Um, like people who surf at San Onofre like that hot water, but the kelp that used to live there considers that hot water pollution. So thermal pollution is unwanted input of temperature, um, something that shouldn't be there, and power plants make a lot of thermal pollution. Um, Cogeneration was mentioned earlier in my class. I think I didn't put a star in the reader for this word. Cogeneration is when you do two things with your fuel. So you burn natural gas or you burn straw to make steam for electricity. And then that heat is used for another purpose, like to dry tobacco or to heat somebody's house or some other purpose. The idea goes, that you're generating two things, co-generating. You're generating electricity, and while you're at it, let's heat up houses. Um, cool. And then um, when we were talking about petroleum refining, about fractional distillation, um, it was in the distillates of carbon, but I didn't highlight a new word for you. This is new vocab at the last minute. There's something called naphtha. Uh, some people pronounce it naphtha. Um, and light naphtha is the shortest carbon chains. They're the lightest liquid of the carbon. So there's like the C100, which is asphalt, and C15, which is gasoline, and carbon-5 or carbon-6 are the most common petroleum product, and this is how we do all modern chemistry. Because it's not a lot of carbon, you can take off one or two pieces, and now that's really useful. So this is how we make basically the entire plastics industry uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, all the pesticides, paint and pigment. Um, naphtha is the building block for modern chemistry. And so it's a huge amount of the petroleum industry that becomes all sorts of consumer products. Um, the coating on my coffee mug and the paint here was probably made in a factory that started with naphtha. That's how they made this wacky rubber for my weird rubber drinking glass, um, the plastic and rubber casing for my phone. Um, basically all modern synthetic commercial chemistry comes from petroleum. And I should have highlighted that uh, when we talked about um, fractional distillation. Um, I guess this might not be obvious, but ultimately all of our electricity sources come from the sun, uh, except for nuclear and geothermal. Uh, 
Um, sunlight makes photovoltaics. Sunlight heats up uh, all of the ocean thermal energy sources and all of the solar thermal energy sources. Um, sunlight is used for photosynthesis, so that's what gets fossilized into fossil fuels, or that's what um, gets uh, eaten by animals, and then we can um, digest their poop to make natural gas. Um, basically, sunlight is at the heart. Oh, by the way, sunlight creates wind, and sunlight creates waves by making high pressure and low pressure areas that are hot and cold. Um, uh, sunlight evaporates the water that becomes the rain. So dams are powered by sunlight, ultimately. Um, thank God the sun's not running out. This might be a moot conversation, but when we think about the laws of thermodynamics and energy conversions, that's just kind of a neat thing. Uh, it came up on an AP test once, so I thought I'd mention that. Um, also, this came up on an AP test, and I thought these questions were a little bit unfair, but I got to prepare you for the AP test. So, um, the country with the most coal in the ground, the most total on the map, is the United States, followed by Russia, Australia, China, and India. You can see those at the bottom, the reserves. But the countries that produce the most, like dig it out of the ground and then use it, are China, India, United States, Indonesia, and Australia. Um, it's important to point out that China and India have growing coal production and coal usage. And that is something that you have to know. In the United States, we're kind of declining. Coal's no longer competitive here. But in China and India, these are exploding markets with growing populations that are rapidly developing. So their demand for electricity is going through the roof and thus their contributions to climate change are increasing. Um, I wanna just kind of remind you about some math and then I wanna add a type of math. Um, there's plain old percentages uh, in energy conversations. I can't remember which ones show up on your exam. Uh, don't forget the kilowatt hour stuff. I warned you in advance. We've practiced that a lot earlier in this unit. Um, you know, if your light bulb has 5% efficiency, that means 5% of that energy is becoming light because the purpose of a light bulb is to give off light. And then the rest of that electricity is becoming heat. Um, a light bulb is 5% efficient at making light. By the way, it's a 95% efficient heat source, right? Because that same light bulb, if it's making 5% light, will make 95% heat. Um, the thing that I have to add here is half-life. And half-life is usually pretty simple. You can use a modified rule of, of 70, but I don't think you'll need that. Um, so half-life is the way that we measure how something will decay radioactively. So if you've got a bunch of uranium, its half-life is 4 billion years. That means in 4 billion years, you have now lost half the uranium. The other stuff has fallen apart. It's become something other than uranium. Uh, that's the concept of half-life. It's how we measure how radioactive something is. If it's very radioactive, it's gonna fall apart quickly. So it has a short half-life. So short half-life is more dangerous to you. Does that make sense? Because it's more radioactive. While you're around it, more pieces will be fired off. Uh, so if you've got like a one pound sample and the half-life is 20 years, you're going to have half a pound 20 years from now. And then you'll have a quarter 20 years after that, or you'll have an eighth 20 years after that. You can see this in my slide. 
So you can keep going, right? From 2020 to 2040, you'll get to a half. From 2040 to 2060, you'll get to a quarter left. From 2060 to 2080, you'll only have an eighth left. And then from 2080 to the year 2100, you would have one sixteenth of a pound, one ounce. Um, if your uh, sample has a known radioactivity, like how much energy it's giving off, well, it'll give off that energy as it falls apart. So you can also do the same thing for measures of radioactivity. So a Curie is the unit that we use to measure radioactivity. And um, if you're starting with 100 Curies, after one half-life, it would have half that much radioactivity left, the radioactive energy, because it's given off the others. Um, Okay, so half-life is the idea that you um, fall apart um, over time, and half-life is how long it takes to lose half that material, and a short half-life is more dangerous because that means it's falling apart more quickly. There will be more radioactive decay while you're around. Um, just as some general reminders, do your math carefully, like ask yourself, does it make sense that I just paid a trillion dollars for a light bulb? Or does it seem kind of reasonable that I spend 12 bucks running a television for a month? Um, remember that your numbers have to be reasonable and you have to work slowly when you have math problems. Uh, I think that there is some math on this exam. Uh, remember to answer your questions separately. It's really difficult to grade you correctly when you don't separate A from B from C, because I can't tell if the topic is bleeding or if you're still trying to explain the last part. Answer A separately from B, separately from C. And um, a big hint for this exam, if you're asked for two options, make sure they're not the same option. Like if I ask you for two ways to save water, the key might say um, use efficient appliances and run the sprinklers less, but a lot of kids would list two appliances. Like you could say a more efficient shower head and a more efficient faucet. Be careful that your two examples are not two options for the same concept. If you're asked for two reasons that shampoo is better, give two reasons that are different. Okay, that's it for the hints and that's it for the reminders. Uh, again, I'm here all day to answer questions. Um, I'll see you back in class.